I'm John Quinn with the law firm of Quinn Emanuel Urquhart and Sullivan and today I'm going to be talking about mediation process and tactics. Mediation can be a cost-effective means of resolving disputes without trial. Most mediations are voluntary, but U.S. courts usually expect parties to try to mediate before trial. Judges expect that if you're going to take up the time of a courtroom in a busy courthouse to try a case, you first will have exhausted the possibilities of settlement, including by engaging in a mediation process. Some commercial contracts actually require the parties to mediate disputes before filing a lawsuit. Now, when should you mediate? And as to this, there really is no one answer. Sometimes a mediation at the outside of a case, or even before a case is filed, can save time and money, as well as keeping the dispute private. Other times, it's not practical to mediate until the evidence has been developed as part of the discovery process. But too often, cases are not mediated until the very eve of trial, the proverbial settlement on the courthouse steps, when most of the work has already been completed and many of the costs of preparing the case for trial have already incurred. Then it can be more difficult to settle a case because of the costs already invested. The short answer as to when to mediate is when the parties have enough information that they can have a meaningful discussion about settlement. The parties typically select a mediator by agreement. Most professional mediators are retired judges or lawyers. Mediators often work for a service provider like JAMS or appear on a list maintained by the court. There are th probably thousands of mediators in the United States, but the number of truly skilled mediators for significant disputes is really limited. These skilled mediators are usually booked much in advance, so as soon as you know that there's a prospect of a mediation on the horizon and you can reach agreement on the mediator, it's important to reach out and try to get on their schedule as soon as you can. In choosing a mediator, it's important to learn as much as possible about a mediator before making the selection. Each mediator has their own strengths, weaknesses, and style. Some mediators are stronger on the law. Other mediators focus on the equities. Some study the party's positions and engage in in-depth examination of the party's strengths and weaknesses of each side's case. Other mediators try to keep the parties talking as long as possible and try to make incremental progress as they go. The type of mediator you want depends on the parties, the personalities, the issues involved, and the strengths of your case. If you have what you frankly think is a weak case, you might want a mediator who will keep the parties talking and negotiating, rather than one of those mediators who digs into the merits and presses hard on the merits. If your client is a hothead, you might not want a mediator who will be confrontational with the client. You might want a mediator who is, has an easier manner and is not confrontational. On the other hand, sometimes you'll want a mediator who will be direct and candid with your client and be able to say things directly to your client about the weakness of their position, things that you as the lawyer may find difficult to say. A mediator who simply relays offers and counteroffers back and forth is usually a waste of time. In selecting a mediator, you should find out whether the, he or she has worked with the opposing party or lawyer. If they have previously worked with your adversary, they might be biased based on their past interaction or the prospect that your adversary will send them future business, future mediation engagements. If you have a strong case, you might want to agree to a mediator proposed by the other side. The other side might take that mediator more seriously if the mediator tells them they have a weak case. Before the mediation, most mediators require the parties to submit written summaries of their case and prior settlement discussions. They then study the parties' positions and can engage in depth on the strengths and weaknesses of each side's case. Consider whether you want to exchange these submissions with the other side. That's, it's, often, it's not uncommon to say that we're not going to exchange our mediation briefs. Only the mediator will see them. Sharing your submission with the other side can educate them about your views and could help them adapt their own strategy if the matter does not settle. On the other hand, it might help you to learn the other party's view of the case. Sharing submissions also enables you to convey information and signals before the mediation. If you exchange submissions, you, should, you may want to hold back some facts or arguments that they might not have considered. You can share these separately with the mediator in the mediation and or with the other side if the issues arise during the mediation. In other words, defer the decision about whether you're going to share 
that type of information. Mediations usually take place in a conference room at the office of the mediator or one of the lawyers. A client representative with authority to settle the case must attend. If there's insurance coverage, the carrier should attend or be available by phone. Attorneys should educate their clients about the mediator and about the process in advance. They should also discuss when the client will talk instead of the lawyer, what they will say, and what their negotiating strategy will be. The mediator will try to influence the client by speaking directly with them. The mediator even may, may ask to speak alone with the client outside the lawyer's presence. And that's something that a lawyer should think very carefully about whether they want to permit that. The client should be prepared to respond to the mediator's questions without betraying any lack of confidence or weakness. The lawyer should have a call with the mediator before the mediation to go over the case and the logistics. Some lawyers use this pre-mediation talk with the mediator to alert the mediator to difficult or unusual issues, including non-monetary issues, such as potential injunctive relief, or corporate governance issues, or insurance coverage issues. On the day of the mediation, the mediation often begins with the mediator holding a meeting with both parties and their lawyers present in a conference room where the mediator lets the parties address each other. This happens sometimes and sometimes it doesn't happen. Often the, the parties even, never even see each other. They'll be in separate conference rooms until the end if a settlement is reached. If there is a joint session, as they call them in the beginning, where the parties have a chance to address each other, it's an opportunity to talk directly to the other side, to show them your position and your resolve. But it is more often the case that the parties and their lawyers spend the entire day in separate rooms while the mediator engages in shuttle diplomacy. The mediator may give the client an opportunity to tell their story and vent their frustrations, but the client must be careful not to tell the mediator anything that should not be relayed to the other side. You have to assume that the mediator will share anything you say with the other side unless there is an express agreement with the mediator that particular information is not to be conveyed. It's important to have hard copies of key documents and evidence to show the mediator when an issue comes up. Under what's called the mediation privilege, communications before and during the mediation are confidential. They are not admissible or subject to discovery. But if the mediator knows the judge assigned to your case, you always have to be alert to the risk that those discussions may be shared with the judge. It's not uncommon for there to be these back channel conversations between the judge and the mediator. If a mediator believes that one party has been unreasonable in the mediation and somehow that gets to the judge, that could potentially influence the judge going forward. It's best to act reasonably and respectfully towards the mediator no matter what. Most good mediators will give the parties their, the mediator's assessment of the merits of the case. Because the mediator is trying to bring the parties together, the mediator will emphasize, emphasize to each side its weaknesses and the reasons that they should settle. Some mediators focus solely on getting a deal concluded whether or not it's a fair resolution. The client must be prepared to push back when the mediator presses issues, the mediator tries to soften the client, the client must be prepared to push back, to show strength, resolve, and to provide counterpoints. For example, mediators often use the expense of taking the case to trial to get the client to compromise. The client might be prepared to say, in those cases, that the cost is not a concern, or the case is a matter of principle, and not simply a question of money. Some negotiation tactics to anticipate in a mediation. After the mediator is satisfied that all parties have had a chance to explain their positions and responses to the mediator, and the mediator has had a chance to convey those to the other side, the mediator will move the parties into the negotiation process. The claimant, the plaintiff, will usually make the first initial demand, followed by a series of counteroffers with the parties coming closer and closer together. The parties will often make no real progress until mid-afternoon. Many cases actually there isn't a progress till 3 or 4 or 5 p.m. The mediation may go into the evening or even into another day. The parties must be patient and the client must be prepared not to move too fast. Do not make a best and final offer unless it really is your best and final offer and never make an offer like that very early in the process. 
It's often helpful to ask a mediator to guide your next move. Ask the mediator, what would you do? The mediator has spoken privately with the other side and may have a better sense of how much they might move. And I would always listen to what the mediator has to say when asked, what do you think we should do? Not that you should follow it necessarily, but it's a useful piece of information. Mediators often try to close a gap by getting the parties to negotiate within a specified range. That is, will you accept, will you agree to negotiate within the range of $25 million and $75 million? This would signal that the party is willing to settle at the upper or the lower end of that range. Sometimes a dispute can be resolved by the parties agreeing to do future business together, so neither side wins or loses. Before the mediation, you should consider if such a resolution is possible. Is there a business resolution? So you can propose it if the parties cannot agree on a monetary settlement. If the parties do not reach an agreement, the mediator might make what's called a mediator's proposal. This is a proposal that the mediator conveys to both sides, often at the conclusion of the mediation. Each side tells the mediator only whether it accepts yes or no to the mediator's proposal. There are no counter proposals. If both sides accept, there's a settlement. If either side says no, there is no settlement. And the mediator will not tell a party that rejected the proposal whether the other side accepted it. So you don't lose face or give up a negotiating position by indicating to the mediator you will accept the mediator's proposal because if there's no settlement, the mediator is not going to say that. So there's no risk of giving up one's settlement position by saying yes to a mediator's proposal. If the parties reach an agreement, they should put the key terms into a signed term sheet right away so the settlement is documented before the parties have second thoughts. It can be helpful to bring a draft term sheet to the mediation and then insert the economic terms later. After the formal mediation session is over, good mediators typically continue to talk with the parties to facilitate further negotiations if a settlement has not been achieved. Even if a matter does not settle during the mediation, the parties may settle and often, often do settle afterwards. Mediations can thus begin a conversation and an education process that leads to a settlement days, weeks, or months later. Mediation has become a key part of the dispute resolution process in the United States. Most cases will go through a mediation at some point. It's well worth the time to think carefully about the mediation process and to come up with a strategy that will maximize the chance of achieving a resolution at that mediation.